All right. Um, I pretty much spent my time taking a break, trying to get my, my brain together to talk more about House of Dragon. <laughs> Uh, I love talking about it though in a public uh, venue that uh, something like a forum or a, a social media allows for it because I mean it it is wonderful to get a crowd sense of opinion. Uh, sometimes it confirms what you believe, sometimes it clashes what you believe. Uh, I really will say a lot of people this, this episode is a lot more complex than it seemed to be to me. A lot of the the um, subterfuge and, and uh, plotting seem to be pretty self-evident as of this moment. Obviously, there's no way for us to know exactly how far this spreads out and entails. Uh, a lot of what Lairs is doing has pretty wide-ranging uh, effects that you, probably, you couldn't possibly figure out in the course of just one episode. But I thought a lot of the subterfuge was pretty evident. And a lot of subterfuge uh, spun from one girl that we used to know of as a pretty sweet and charming person who's very callous and fucking cold-hearted. Uh, Allison Hightower, now played by Olivia Cook. Olivia Cook is stunning. Just a beautiful woman. Um, she's gorgeous. And the thing about her character is that we now are clashing this natural beauty and grace with this spirit that has been worn down and, and worn ragged, really, by the bullshit of King's Landing. This woman, as a girl, she was not meant to be a part of this. She was just trying to be another motherfucker, really. Just, you know, a, a, a spawn of the Hand of the King. But Otto Hightower, he was playing eight-dimensional eight chess. He was doing some shit that we would have never seen happen. And I don't think he really gave a fuck about positioning his kid uh, for a life of tragedy uh, trauma, all that shit, cause I, I shit Otto cared about. That wasn't Otto's character. And we see kind of the forbearance of those fruits really in episode 5, but especially in this one, where because of that, that almost ruthless sentiment that you need your kid to be on this throne. Literally the last thing he said to her before he was banished, uh, no idea if he'll ever come back, but literally the last thing he said to her was you need to make sure that kid's on the throne. No matter what, Rhaenyra is going to eventually take care of that kid in so many ways. Aegon Targaryen is your lifeline to basic living. Uh, I think he kind of extended it past... Yeah, there's some implications that he extended it past to where you yourself, your own life, will be probably on the line here. Not just Aegon Targaryen's. But um, this is the product that Otto created was what we get now with Allison. Uh, and in part, Rhaenyra is a big part of this too. Because of Rhaenyra's deceitfulness, that's what made Otto take that... I, I won't bail Otto out. And it's like, Otto had two... I mean, we saw the scene. Otto was thinking about it. He had two choices. He could have let that shit stay. And everything would have been hunky-dory. Or he tried to play what was a desperation card and basically Rhaenyra out the paint. He thought he could put it to such a way to the king where he could get her out the paint. He didn't. He's blind. I mean, he, he knew better than anybody. Viserys is thickly blind to things he does not want to accept. That was one of those truths that he just did not want to accept. That she could have been sleeping with an op. <laughs> with any op. Yeah, his brother, somebody else. It didn't matter who. Obviously, being Damon probably didn't help, but he, he, played, he played his cards, and his cards, they weren't good enough. And unfortunately, Allison has to deal with that since then because now Allison has no allies. Even though I, mean, I think the advice she was getting from her father was not very uh, virtuous and uh, unbiased, to say the very least. So, <laughs> so, but I mean, with that being the case, I put it up there like, let's say Sansa, uh, let's say the Lannisters win the Five King War, whatever the fuck that was called, um, and they rule over for decades and decades. That's what Sansa would have been doing with, basically being on tiptoes. 24-7, her kids being the only value that she has to whoever the king would have been at that point. Basically being a circuit uh, for producing kids and being a good face for the king. Olivia, because of uh, Allison's or Allison, Allison, because of the king's declining health, has been able to maneuver a little bit better than uh, Sansa ever would have been able to. 
And uh, she's been able to pretty much put her own foot down and get her own stake in this whole situation because of the truth that uh, Chris and Cook, Chris and Cole provided, Cole World. So she doesn't have much value in that truth, but she can at least be cognizant that truth exists and not just be willfully ignorant while some other people in the red keep have to basically tiptoe around that reality. She can kind of just position it, although she obviously was not named names or anything like that, so that effect of who, maybe the one giving Renee the uh, dirty dick. Uh, so... That's just a background. She's had three kids now. All four kids. She has three sons, I believe. Just she has the girl that she has, Amen and Aiden. But she's just a third, right? Or a uh, fourth. I don't know. So she has, she has at least those two, Aiden and Amen, and then she has. The other one, who I don't even know her fucking name, but the, the, the girl that we saw at a certain point in there, too. Uh, so these three, she has, a, uh, you know, pretty much a full-on supposition that these three are her lifeline and these three are her family. That this, this is her family. The Targaryens are not her family. Those other two boys got nothing to do with her. Renera has nothing to do with her. They're not one house. It's the High Tower Targaryens, and then it's the other Targaryens. That's her viewpoint on the world, and that's how she positioned it to Aegon Targaryen um, when he was jerking off. And it's on the same place that fucking Bran Stark got pushed down from. It's a cold world. It's a cold world. So, um, as I said, she's very, she's very uh, cold-hearted, but she's also cunning. Uh, she... Essentially, Lara's strong, uh, Lionel's kid, pretty much the only one that I think considers her a friend. And I would probably suppose that, in a way, he might be her only ally, although we kind of see that ally uh, definition stretched quite a bit towards the end of this episode. So she confides in him about basically castle-like stuff. He's, um... I don't think Varys or Littlefinger ever gave Robert Baratheon like dirt. I don't think they ever gave the Lannisters dirt. But essentially, the way that like those two confide about dirt, it's kind of the same principle between Alicent and Larys. They pretty much gossip, basically, and um, it hasn't been essentially effective or actionable. With uh, even, you know, that reality being out that there was a bastard, it really hasn't mattered to this point. But this is actionable. Essentially, after Harwin beats the fuck, and not beats the fuck, really, it just pushes uh, Aegon out the way. But essentially, after that happens, and they have a real chance to boast and promote this bastard theory, they have a means of getting Rhaenyra off of the lineage for the throne. And I think some of the emotions that Allison let out gave. Here's what happened. So basically, uh, li, what's his name? Like, I just his name. Laris. Laris Varus. Laris, uh, basically, a successor to Littlefinger in a way. Uh, and also, it has some Varus in him too. But really, more Littlefinger than anything, he essentially takes a bunch of prisoners, uh, cuts their tongue off so they can't talk about what they're about to do. And he pretty much forms his own little army. Uh, and I say army lightly, but a gang of very uh, ruthless and seemingly cunning fighters uh, that operate as secret individuals, almost like how the Hand of the King, the former one, Otto, had his own, you know, little spies. This is what he has, is this little militia almost. So they, they he, he, as he put it on the behest of Alice and Hightower, which she wanted, I guess, some retribution here, which is what the conversation I saw, I took from them, the interpretation I had from the conversation was that she was almost wanting a hit without actually calling out a hit, because she wanted to make sure for certainty that these other Targaryens are out of the paint. Now, I don't think she wanted them killed, per se, but I think she kind of wanted them out of the paint, you know? Like, 
she wanted A without saying she really wanted A. So I think she might have wanted a B instead, but he went for A. So he has essentially his own brother and father murdered in Heron Hall as Heron Hall's room was burned down by the uh, secret goons, the, the goon squad. They go through, they burn the whole place down, uh, essentially kill the two most important people they need to kill, but also a bunch of other individuals from that, uh, that town. So... Uh, obviously, some pretty big, uh, wide-reaching uh, potentials there because as as of that moment, uh, Lionel was still the hand of the king, and he got burned alive. And Harwin was the father of, for what some big account for it, the father of those three Targaryen kids. And of course, someone who does know they're the father is the mother of those three Targaryen kids. And a lot of people are going to think that. The person who was the most spiteful of those kids, Allison Hightower, had something to do with it. So, I think Allison was shocked about the hit he put on them because of her kind of both flexible and unassailable, like kind of code of ethics. Like she's definitely abided by a very black and white world for a while, and while. The shit that's happened in King's Land has definitely uh, put some dents into that 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 moral, that sense of morals. She still clearly holds on to it very often uh, when you kind of look at her decision making about things and as the way she evaluates things. But she is just absolutely taken aback and shocked by what Larys does. She didn't say anything really uh, of consequence one way or the other, but she clearly indicates that she had nothing to do in actually calling the hit out on them. He just supposes that. Uh, without saying so many, so many things, that's just what she wanted. And uh, he says it to her. I think he clearly just did it because she's an ally that can get him more power uh, by in turn giving her more power. So that's my reading on it. I just think he said whatever he needed to say to her to make sure that she didn't think he was a crazy dude acting of his own accord. But um, a really, really good episode for, for this now jaded and, uh, you know, almost bloodlusted, but not quite. Not quite, not yet. Uh, Bloodlusted uh, Allison Hightower. Uh, she's completely thrown away any semblance of a relationship she has with uh, with her former sister. She pretty much treats the king like an old codger. I mean, she does everything to pretty much ignore him, slice up his opinion, pretty much everything she can get away with without actually being put to trial or anything like that. So if he needs help sometimes, she'll just walk away if she's mad enough. Uh, she'll storm off. Uh, she'll say shit that she knows it will roll him up. I mean, he is clearly in that stage. Where, I mean, we saw literally when they were having coitus. Uh, it was very, it was loveless. She was almost disgusted by this guy. This is the, again, the, uh, the fruits that uh, were born out of that. This guy was essentially a sugar daddy. That she didn't even want, and now she's just like, I don't give a fuck. You don't matter to me. You're gonna die soon. Uh, my kids are all I care about, and protecting them. You are you there? I mean, I'm not sure she hates him per se, but she clearly does not have much favor left for the die. And the more things that he does, that pretty much keeps Renera in her position to keep on being uh, deceitful, the less she clearly uh, likes him. So I'm not sure what she may do to him as the season progresses, because. He's obviously going to ride for Renair as much as he can. That's just his thing. He's not going to willingly allow it become a thing where like he's just like, no, she is having relations with random dudes on the street. Oh, man, I have to pick somebody else over Renair. Oh, no. I don't know if he gets that anytime soon, but she's going to definitely, even Renair, uh, Renair's guy said it, she's going to put honey in his ear. She's going to try to play the auto high tower type games that was – genetically given to her and try to get him to understand that she ain't no good. Renair ain't damn good. My key is right here, blonde. So that's the relationship with the king. The king. We talked about kind of the things she had with Laris. Uh That's one of the big things. I mean, Kristen Cole is one of her few, I guess, confidants in the way, although she scolded him for calling the uh, queen a C-word. Um, so she's, again, you know, these code of ethics and all that shit. She's still... Weirdly abides by them. He can talk shit all he wants, but he can't call her. 
Uh, that's just not something that's okay. So it's weird, kind of, kind of, kind of odd, but it just is what it is, I guess. So we have this situation where she's allyless uh, in, in, in so many ways. She's callous, but she has to keep on positioning, just keep on maneuvering for her kid's sake. And she has a chance now to really uh, make something happen here. So I'm very interested to see the card she plays with now the Strong's dead and the Hand of the King up, you know, up for grabs. Uh, her being probably, I don't think the most trusted confidant the King now has with Lionel being charboiled. Um, I, I imagine she tries to play her hands to the best. I'm not sure if we still have Rhaenyra in Dragonstone now that her kid's father got killed. Maybe she comes to confront Olivia Cook. I'm not sure what she does. I'm not sure either what they do. But I am very interested at that to, to see what those two do. Um, that's the big, big thoughts. Uh, for their, I, I'll just do two, two quick predictions for those two characters. I see Rhaenyra by the end of next episode actively attempting to hurt uh, Allison Hightower. I think she looks at it as war almost by the end of next episode. If not by the next episode, by episode 30, certainly. Um, and then I think Allison successfully, by one way or another, poses the truth of the situation to Viserys by the, by the end of episode 2. That's just my kind of short and succinct uh, predictions. I'm going to do more Game of Thrones content or House of Dragon content, especially episode six. Kind of going to the deeper a little bit how I think things played out. Really, I mean, the episode's really titled The Princess of the King. The two biggest characters I covered, but I didn't even touch on Daemon Targaryen. I didn't touch on that Valerian kid. I didn't touch on what might be the feedback or the uh, fallout behind uh, him, you know, Turning down the uh, the offer she had for going like the Driftmark, being basically callous to the principle of, I guess, apologizing to the king and maybe even seeing Dragonstone again. Uh, there's a lot of things I didn't cover here, but I'll, I'll really look back into it, maybe watch the episode again, and then come back with some, uh, some more content. It's going to be a pain to edit this shit. <laughs>